what a blessing and privilege it is to stand with each of you in praise in the assembly to read God's word. I'm going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and to set the stage for Bo, if you want to turn there, I can talk a little bit longer. <laughs> um, Pastor Kenny has been preaching through the first of three letters in the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. Over the first two chapters, Paul has introduced the goal of his instruction to be love and sincerity. Uh, he's instructed and entrusted Timothy to continue to fight the good fight with good conscience and good faith. He's instructed men and women in their roles of prayer, thanksgiving, and worship. And now today we see again men's role in desiring to be an overseer or a deacon. So if you're there, will you read with me, please? It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity, for if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? He must not be a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with clear conscience. These men must also first be tested. Let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malice gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and of good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in the case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Please pray with me. Lord, how marvelous, how wonderful is your grace for us. Your grace towards Paul was not in vain, as he will say in 1 Corinthians. Lord, we thank you that as sinners we are forgiven and saved by your grace. Lord, I pray for Bo as he is going to be bringing your word, preaching through the section I just read. I pray that he would have wisdom and insight through his study and perseverance of your scripture. I pray that he would give us that insight today by your grace. Please, Lord, bless the preaching of your word and the worship from your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Uh, good to see you all this morning. I will welcome our church family and visitors and uh, just let you all know we, we brought a, an extra visitor as well. Uh, Cody Farr, who has been here many times um, over the years, but today is a little bit different in that he comes that he and uh, Caroline just got engaged, my daughter, uh, three days ago. So, yeah. I don't know if that's appropriate for me to announce up here, but I, I got the mic. So it is, it is funny that uh, my son Andrew and Cody really have been best friends since kindergarten, all the way through uh, 12th grade. They graduated high school together and they both went to Mercer and have graduated this past spring, but they were roommates in Mercer, uh, even uh, living together in their house. And um, I didn't know, I guess he was just using him <laughs> to get to Caroline, but anyway, all right. Well, you, you see our assigned uh, text this morning, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and appreciate Colton giving us uh, kind of the backdrop, just a little reminder that obviously we are going through the pastorals, and as we think about Paul writing to Timothy, um, of course, Timothy is the pastor at Ephesus. Um, that's why I chose the passage for the Deacon of the Week that Dave read, where Paul visits the, the elders at Ephesus, and this is when he tells them, you know, this is, I know I'm not going to see you again. 
uh, but he presents them, they're charged to care for the flock. And it really is parallel to now Paul's specific instructions to Timothy, but again, meant for more than just Timothy. Uh, but anyway, he, he tells Timothy to remain at Ephesus. Uh, he's concerned about false teachers. Um, and he actually saw a couple of weeks ago, he calls them out by name and equates uh, false teaching to blasphemy and tells Timothy he's handed them over to Satan. Uh, and so you can see, obviously, Paul is focusing uh, in this epistle on true, true doctrine and the gospel, and he charges Timothy to, to fight the good fight now and hold fast to that uh, doctrine. And you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, too, Kenny said that we always need to keep the introduction in mind as we go now through these different verses and chapters of the epistle. And to me, you know, you always want to keep that in mind because that's the purpose of his writing uh, 1 Timothy. You know, anytime we read, certainly the epistles, but I think broader to any passage of scripture, we should try to keep in mind really who wrote it. Sometimes we don't know, but if we do know who the author is, keep that in mind. Who wrote it? To whom did he write it? And the purpose. Why did he write it? And we see that a little bit more uh, this morning in the passage we'll go through. But you can see if you, in your Bibles or if you're looking on your phone or whatever that really the chapter is divided up into three sections. And we're going to go through those. You can, the caption in my Bible, I have the ESV, uh, but the caption of the first part, the first section in my Bible said qualifications for overseers. The second part, qualifications for deacons. And then third part, the caption I have, it says the mystery of godliness. If I was in charge of the caption, I would have put the household of God. Um, I just think that sounds so uh, personal, really, to consider the church being the household of God. And Colton's read the, the whole chapter for us. I'd like to kind of start where he ended. We're going to cover that la last section first because I think it kind of sets the stage for the first two, or at least stresses the importance of the first two sections. So when we consider that, um, that the household of God, I'm going to reread just the, that, that verse of 14 through 15a. Again, here Paul is giving the purpose for which he wrote the epistle. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how, ought, how one ought to behave in the household of God. So there we have Paul's purpose, why he writes these things. And maybe just this part, but I think really the whole letter, as Colton kind of summarized. He stressed the importance of proper doctrine, the importance of praying, the importance of the women's role in the church, the importance now of appointing the leaders in the church. So here this just really shows Paul's heart for the church, his concern. Uh, he, he, in his letters, he impressed, he states how he's just pressed down with anxiety for his concern for the churches. And we see that he's is like, Paul, uh, Timothy, I plan to come, but if I delay, if I can't get there soon enough, this is so important, I want you to know to how, how to conduct yourself or how one ought to conduct themselves in the household of God. Um, so really, I, I, the focus you can see on these verses 14 and 15 is that Ministers are not only to be focused on preaching, and that is a very important subject and theme of Paul's letter, uh, but focus on preaching. They are to focus on preaching true doctrine. They're to focus on praying. Chapter 2 kind of sets that out for us too. But in this verse, we can see the importance of behavior as well. Not just preaching, not just praying, but behavior is important um, as well. And and he recognizes that ministers now, these leaders in the church, are going to be examples for the flock to follow, right? So he, he stresses that on them. And really one of my favorite verses, I guess is kind of a half of a verse, but 15b, I mean, just look at that again. The household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. And you think about, you know, obviously we know that, that church is not a building, but the way Paul describes it here, it very much seems to be a family. He refers to it as a household. Uh, we carry his name, Christians, we carry the name of Christ. Uh, obviously, we talked about this, Kenny mentioned it a few weeks ago, that there are no grandchildren in God's family, right? 
everyone who receives him by faith, to them he be gave the right to become children of God, those who receive him. So we are adopted as God's children. And the word or the phrase here, I guess he, he refers to, to describe the church, a pillar or a buttress of truth. In the Greek, I was reading this, that really when we look at that phrase, it's, it's uh, any firm basis upon which a thing stands or leans. So it's really something that lifts up or supports another thing. Um, I know a lot of times we can think about it as a foundation, but Kenny and I were talking about that this morning, that really it's not just a foundation, a pillar lifts up and supports. And that's what the church is to do with regard to the truth. Now it's not in the sense that the church is the foundation of truth, but that truth is the foundation of the church. And, th and there's a difference there. Um, the authority of scripture does not depend upon the church to recognize. I mean, truth did not originate with the church. The church does not establish or create truth. Obviously God is the author of truth. It's the job of the church to recognize it and more than just recognize it, but to confess it and, and the rest, and we'll go further into that. But again, the church doesn't establish the, the truth, but it's established on the truth. And you can compare that or contrast that maybe with the views of the Catholic Church, um, where the decrees or the edicts of the Pope or councils, they put on even par with Scripture. But uh, that was one of the main causes of the Reformation. Uh, you'll remember you know, Luther's speech at the Diet of Worms. Oh, you won't remember it. You weren't there, but you recall that great speech uh, that he gave. And when he was called upon to recant, to, to repudiate his writings, um, he gave that, that great speech and said, that unless I am convinced by Scripture and clear reason, I will not recant. And he said in that, in that great speech, he says, I do not trust in popes or councils. Uh, because we all know that they have erred and they have contradicted themselves. So if they've contradicted themselves over time, we know that's not true, right? Because the truth cannot contradict itself. So again, you know, the, Luther goes further in his speech that my conscience is captive to the Word of God. And, and to violate conscience is unsafe. And then he, he closes with that famous phrase, here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. So again, I'm just kind of trying to emphasize the importance that the, the church, even though Paul describes it as a pillar and buttress of truth, the church doesn't establish truth, but it is established on the truth. You can consider that with, with Paul. You remember when Peter gave the great confession uh, to Jesus? It, you know, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responds that, that on this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus himself states that the church is not the foundation, but the church is built on a foundation, and that foundation being truth, and that very truth there is the confession that Peter gave, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's the foundation on which the church uh, is built. So you, you remember a few months ago, Kenny gave that message or that series on what is the church and what's the role of the church, the purpose of the church, and all the rest. Um, here we see it really concisely stated by Paul uh, in these verses that the function of the church, the purpose of the church is to serve as a pillar and buttress of the truth, is to focus on the truth, to learn the truth, to know the truth, to study the truth, to hold fast to it, to confess it, to proclaim it, to preach it, to publish it, to teach it, to pass it generation to generation. A, a great uh, responsibility is set upon the church in this regard. You know, a lot of you guys know I'm, I'm a judge, and one thing I've learned during the five years that I've done it is part of the jo uh, job of a judge is to administer oaths to new, new, new lawyers. When they're, uh, you swear them in so they can practice law in that court, um, and the, we also swear in the uh, prosecutors, those who work at the assistant district or the uh, district attorney's office, the assistant DAs. And part of that oath that we administer to them is that they will support the Constitution. You know, the Constitution of Georgia, the Constitution of the United States, and you know when the president takes his oath of office and, and other government officials, 
they, the oath includes that they will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Well, I think our charge as a church is like that, to support and defend God's truth as it is revealed in his word, that we are charged with the task of transmitting it generation uh, to generation. That's part of our uh, role now as the church. And I, I know you all had the bulletins, and I included a couple of good quotes. I think they're good quotes. Um, I hope you do. But anyway, Calvin really emphasized the importance of this, uh, the importance of the church's role in proclaiming the doctrine that God has entrusted into the hands of the church. Um, he, he, he mentions that the church is the only instrument of preserving the truth, that it may not perish from the remembrance of man. You can see that's a very somber uh, responsibility that the church has. Uh, Calvin points out that God himself doesn't come down to earth uh, from heaven and perform the task. He doesn't entrust this task to angels, but he entrusts it to the church. And there's a, a longer quote that we, I have on the uh, PowerPoint here. It's not in the bulletin, but I think it's very powerful. Uh, Calvin writes that the church maintains the truth because by preaching, the church proclaims it. Because she keeps it pure and entire, because she transmits it to posterity, and if the instruction of the gospel be not proclaimed, if there are no godly ministers who by their preaching rescue truth from darkness and forgetfulness, instantly falsehoods, errors, impostures, superstitions, and every kind of corruption will reign. And when you think about when you read First Timothy and Second Timothy and Titus, how, how many times Paul repeats that? No, don't fall into this meaningless stuff about genealogies and all this other stuff, uh, all these errors and things like that. But the, the last phrase, I think, the last sentence is very uh, powerful as well. In short, silence in the church is the banishment and crushing of the truth. So again, it really just emphasizes the importance of the church's role in, in supporting and defending the truth as it's revealed in Scripture. You know, it, I know everybody has their own, everybody who's a Christian has their own testimony of how God saved them. I mean, we talked about this before, that the content of the gospel doesn't change, right? That all those who receive Jesus as Lord and Savior recognize his atoning sacrifice on the cross as the payment of sins, receive him by faith and repent, that they are adopted as God's children, right? That's, that's the, the objective content of the gospel. But I know everybody has their own personal testimonies to how they uh, received or trusted in that truth. And for me, um, you know, my testimony, I, you know, I was, uh, I was baptized, and well, I was talking to Mary about this earlier, but baptized in the church when we were located across the way over there when I was in fifth grade. And, but I, again, I can't remember what I knew back then, so I don't know if that was when I was converted or if it was later in life when, when God uh, really worked on me um, when I was in college. And I was brought up in the church and went to Sunday school and all that. And then, of course, when you folks go to college, they're faced with a lot of life decisions and, and the rest. Um, and I remember when I was going through that at University of Georgia, I had this professor. In, it was an ethics class. They did teach ethics at the University of Georgia. Um, no, well, anyway, I won't go into that. But anyway, he, he did have us uh, write a paper on, it's kind of a generic thing, but the meaning of life. You know, we had to write a paper on what our view of the meaning, the purpose of life. And so I, I wrote my paper, and I, and I used uh, Solomon and his writing in Ecclesiastes about these vain pursuits he pursued, whether it be riches or pleasures or knowledge, how he found them all to be vanity, and it really came down to the purpose of life was the knowledge of God, to walk with him, please him, and serve him, fear him. And so I wrote that paper, and then I, and I you know, I write it, and I would, considered it, and I thought it was a pretty good paper. Then I considered my life, though, and I compared it. I was like, is that my purpose? It was almost like it was a contradiction. I'm not living like this is the purpose for which God created me. Um, and so 
it was very convicting to me at that time that God used that one of the or one of the things God used was that occasion to kind of stress upon me. Well, if if you believe this is true, then your life ought to show it. And my life at that time was not showing it. So at that time, I did pursue to I need to read the Bible. I read all these other books for college or whatever else. Um, why am I not studying Scripture as I as as I should? Because to me. It really came down to one thing, is the Bible true? I mean, if it's not, you know, we can disregard it. It's just another writing. If it is true, then it, it is of a paramount importance, right? I mean, it, to me, it, is, it was kind of a binary thing. It's either, it's either true or it's not true. And so if I am truly, if I believe that it is true, then I, I should, my life should show it. And so I, I began to read it and study it in college. And I don't know if that's when truly God saved me or, or not. But I just remember at that time, I was like uh, Tom Cruise, you know, a few good men, like, I'm, I, I want the truth, you know, and, and, uh, and actually that's the second reference to a few good men, I think in two weeks that we've had. Oh, Kenny, you guys don't know this, whenever he asks me to speak, he does say, I have to make at least two references to movies. So that, that was my first, was like, I want the truth, and that, and that was, uh, and that was kind of what God used to, to draw me to himself. My well, second reference to a movie, um, actually I don't even know if it was a movie, it was a series that Jill and I watched, I don't know if it was Netflix or was it Prime or whatever. Anyway, it kind of had, it wasn't an uncommon plot, but this guy, the main character, his wife was killed, his daughter was killed, and so he goes on this personal rampage to bring, well not to bring to justice, to kill to kill everybody who is responsible for that. And it turned out to be this big thing. And, and anyway, he's going about his little, his, his rampage against those who are responsible for killing his wife and his daughter. And law enforcement gets involved, FBI, and they recognize that he's killing bad guys. But they communicate with him, it's like, you need to leave that to us. You know, leave it to us, we'll bring him to justice. And then his great line was, I am justice. You know? And that's a cool line in a movie, uh, but the reality is he wasn't justice, he was revenge, you know. Um, but when we talk about the truth, when we talk about the truth that the church is built on, uh, the foundation of truth, well, what is that truth? Well, Jesus describes it. He says, I am the truth. I am the truth. On this truth uh, that serves as the church, uh, as the foundation of the church. Um, one, one of the my favorite books growing, over the years has been Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Um, is one of the few books that I have read multiple times. And in the, in the very beginning of Knowing God, he, Packer quotes Spurgeon uh, when he says that, you know, in, in, I guess it's during a sermon, he says it, it has been said that the proper study of mankind is man. And Spurgeon said, I'm not going to challenge that, but if that's true, I think the, the proper study of God's elect is God. And really, the bottom line is, if, unless, we, unless and until we know who God is, we never really understand, and we never can really understand ourselves as his creatures. And I think it's very obvious today when you look at the world around us, we don't even know if we're men or women. We're not male or female. We don't even know that. That just portrays we lack knowledge of ourselves because we lack knowledge of God. Um, and so when we consider this passage at the end of chapter 3, that the church serves as the pillar and buttress of truth, we need to know that great is the task of the church to confess that. And he, and Paul, in the last verse, verse 16, he lets us know what is the truth that we are to confess. What is the doctrine the doctrine of Christ. He says, great indeed, in verse 16, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. <clears throat> well, Paul uses that word mystery a lot of times in his writings. And what is a mystery? Just in general, what is a mystery? A mystery is something that has to be revealed, right? And so here, that, that, that mystery of godliness, we can tell by the rest of the verse, is Jesus. Because it's a, a great hymn, really, about who Jesus is. Um, and this mystery must be revealed by God because man in his natural state would never know it otherwise. Um, 
man in our, in our natural state would remain spiritually dead and ignorant but for God revealing that truth to us. Um, it's similar that Paul writes about in, first, I mean, in Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 3. He uses, he refers to the mystery again. Uh, here we go. It says, great indeed we confess. Is that what it says? It is what it says. All right. For the, oh, I got a different translation. Let me read that one. No, that's the same one. I'm sorry. Let me read. That, that, that's, that's 1 Timothy 3. That's okay. I'll read it. Y'all listen to it. Here you go. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given for me to you, given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written. So we know Jesus revealed himself in a very powerful way to Paul on the road to Damascus. But in that same, not in that way, but the, the truth is God has to reveal, Jesus reveals himself to us for us to receive him. So this, this mystery is revealed by God. And now the end, verse 16, this is what many commentators hold to be Paul quoting an old hymn. Um, the, the last verses, um, the last phrases, I think there's six phrases uh, that are included to describe Jesus in the last part of verse 16. He, and just if you got it again, you can go back. There we go. Yeah, just look at those phrases. It says, he was manifested in the flesh. Of course, that's referring to Jesus' incarnation. Um, that man, we could not rise to him, but he came down to us. That's the only way we could have had a relationship with God. I read this in, in one of the commentaries on this passage that I thought it was very good that with the incarnation, you know, Jesus is it's a, it's a means by which Jesus has concealed himself to a degree. I mean, we could not have uh, viewed the glory of God in a physical way. So it was an act of self-concealment by Jesus uh, by being incarnate. But with that self concealment, there is self-revelation. That by, by being incarnate, by leaving the glories of heaven to come down as man, to live among people, that with that self-concealment is an act of self-revelation. He showed his infinite love, his condescending love, that he would leave that to come to live among us. So he's manifested in the flesh, that, that incarnation showing his infinite condescending love. He's vindicated by the Spirit, though he's, he's despised and rejected of men, he's vindicated by the Spirit. And we know that at the resurrection, that Jesus accepted, our God, the Father accepted Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross. Spirit raised him from the dead. Uh, he's seen by angels. And you just think about the, the life of Jesus, all these main events in his life, how it was accompanied by angels from his his birth, uh, temptation in the wilderness, uh, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, ascension into heaven, that, that he was seen by angels. He's proclaimed among the nations. The gospel is spread to Gentiles, spread throughout all the world, and he's believed on in the world, so the gospel was not proclaimed in vain. Uh, God's word did not return to him void, but he was believed on in the world. That shows the power of the gospel. And he's taken up in glory. Again, referring to the ascension, that he's exalted at God's right hand. So Paul, probably quoting an early hymn here at the end of uh, chapter 3, but these are truths of who Jesus is, right? And these are fundamental truths of who Jesus is. And if, if these are fundamental truths, then these are the very truths that Satan would be seeking to attack challenge, to cast doubt on, to do whatever he could to, to uh, challenge those truths. So these are the fundamental truths of, um, of who Jesus is. Now as we consider that, you know, as we consider the church, this mystery of godliness, this mystery of who Jesus is, is to be understood, is to be believed, to be loved, to be proclaimed. Well now how do we do that? Well to me that's how we, that's why we go back to verse 1. That's why I kind of wanted to do it in this way. Uh, that, this, that these truths entrusted to the church 
um, that the church has such a great weight now and responsibility placed on its leaders to carry out the function of the church. So pastors are entrusted with this great treasure. And so this ought to be obviously a great motivation to them that they should exercise their responsibility with diligence, industry, faithfulness, reverence, as they discharge their duties um, and not allow the truth to be bar marginalized. So again, this great responsibility is set now for the pastors to fulfill the purpose, to make known his truth. And then so therefore uh, that leads to appointing the leaders of the church, the qualifications now. So we'll go back to the first part of the chapter. Um, and we can see because of these two uh, parts of chapter three, how it can be broken down to qualification for overseers, qualifications for deacons, that there really are two orders of ministers in the early church. Um, you had the function of overseers and deacons. Um, and, and Paul refers to that in his letter to Philippians. Uh, I don't know, Jess, if you had that Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, again, just introducing and, and, and addressing the church at Philippi. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons. So we have these two orders of leaders in the early church. Uh, and when we look at the first part of this chapter, when we're talking about overseers, the word here in the Greek is episkopos, and it can mean overseer, it can mean bishop, it can mean pastor, and um, generally it means who, one who has general oversight of others. And I think pastor kind of enca en encapsulates that meaning the church is the flock, the pastor is to guide the flock. Another word that is sometimes used is presby presbyteroi. I practice that too. Um, and I still don't think I get it right. But anyway, that, 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 that Greek term is more commonly referred to as elders, but it seems to be interchangeable. Um, and we're going to see that in Titus 1 when we get to that pastoral epistle. But in Titus 1, uh, Paul uses elder and overseer interchangeably. He tells Titus, All right, I left you in Crete to appoint elders, and when you go about doing that, remember that an overseer should have these qualities. So he kind of uses them interchangeably here. So uh, it may refer to a different facet of their leadership. An elder may refer more to their qualification, maturity, experience, things like that. Overseer kind of refers to the function to watch over God's flock. Uh, now, that is a totally different word than what he uses for deacons. Uh, in verse 8, deacons, the, the Latin word for, or the Greek word for that is diakonos, diakonos, uh, which means servant, one who serves under the uh, leadership of the elders. So deacons typically care more for the temporal concerns of the church, uh, maintaining the ministers and being, assistant, being uh, assistance to them. But as, as we go through this now, and, and I'm not, anyway, we'll just press on, but I'm not going to take as long in this point as the others, because I know this is not an ordination service, and we're not ordaining an elder or a deacon. So, so anyway, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, on the qualifications themselves. But Paul does write that the, he opens up this chapter in this section saying that the saying is trustworthy, that if a person aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. And you may kind of wonder with that word aspire, well, should somebody aspire to be a leader in the church, a minister, a pastor, or is it called by God? Is that position called by God? And in what Dan, uh, Dave read for us in Acts 20, he, he charges the elders at Ephesus, or he says, God, God may, or the Holy Spirit made you overseers. So we know it's a calling from God, but I still think part of that call is the desire to serve in that role. I think with the call, you would have that desire. I, I think it's possible to have the desire, not have the call. I don't think it's possible to have the call without the desire. But regardless, Paul describes this job as the overseer as a work. In the, in the ESV, it's translated as a task. So obviously, it's a, it's a toil, it is a toilsome and, and it, responsibility full of difficulty. And, they need to consider that before they aspire to it, that it was not a light matter. Um, and then as he goes through the qualifications, he's not writing it just for Timothy, but hey, if anybody's aspiring for this position, 
you need to prayerfully consider these qualifications, examine yourselves and your lives. Um, and you can see on these qualifications, some of them are listed positively, some of them are listed negatively. He's not this, but he is that. Um, one thing that you almost summarizes it is verse 2, he says, above reproach, that it is a person of unquestioned morality, good character, unstained by vice or scandal. Um, otherwise, that would undermine their positions of authority. And then we can see one characteristic that is shared by elders or overseers and deacons is verse, contained in verse 2 and in verse 12, that they are the husband of one wife. Again, literally, that translates into a, they are one woman man. Uh, husband and one wife, one woman man. And there can be a debate on what is the proper meaning of that. Some would say that, you know, this is an indication of faithfulness, so that this prohibits polygamy, obviously, and promiscuity. Um, so we know it's at least that. Some may say there's no more than that. I'm kind of more in that mindset that that's what it is. Uh, that's what the qualification entails. You can ask the question, well, does it require that somebody be married? Uh, it says they must be uh, above reproach, a husband and one wife. Does that mean they must be married? Well, it wouldn't seem so because Paul wasn't married. And would he be disqualified from serving as, a, as an overseer? The um, question can be asked, is it, does it prohibit remarriage? You know, but we think about the history of the church. We don't have the, med or they didn't have the medical advancements, and a lot of folks died young. Does this prohibit somebody who suffered, who was a widower early on that prevents them from being remarried? Um, and then uh, I guess a more current question is, will this prohibit divorce? If somebody is divorced, can they uh, serve as an overseer? Well, you know, to me, what, what is critical in that regard is, well, you know, what about if they were divorced before they even became a Christian? You know, the old self is dead. Are we going to hold that against them? They can't serve when they're new creatures? And so there is debate in that, and I think reasonable minds can disagree in that regard. As far as us here at Bonaire First Baptist Church, I mean, we, we hold, we maintain to a case-by-case -case method. We'll consider each candidate as they're mentioned. Um, it's not an automatic disqualifier. If somebody was divorced, we'll, it may disqualify, but it's not automatic. We consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. So that, that phrase did, is subject to a little bit more discussion, uh, certainly in different churches. But here you can see in the, these characteristics, just a, a general list here. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through, through them all. I mean, you can read and understand them pretty straightforwardly by, by Paul. Um, it is interesting to me that there are, you know, there's similar, similar qualifications for elders and for deacons. There's a lot of similarity between these two lists. Uh, but there is one distinction. There's a qualification for elders that aren't included in the qualifications for deacons. And that's in verse 2, that an overseer should be, ha should be able to teach. That they have teaching ability. That every elder should possess that uh, gift to some extent. What is interesting to me when you look at this list is that the link to family relationships uh, throughout the list. You know, you're, you're, there's references to wives and children and managing your own household well, and especially when we consider the household of God. Um, and to me, you can almost have this analogy between leadership and the management of a home with that of a church. Uh, that there's similar skills involved. Uh, I read this in a commentary. It's kind of a sobering thought. But they describe that as this, it, the one way to scrutinize a, a candidate is a reliable but not infallible means of determining the quality of one's potential leadership is by examining the behavior of their children. And that, to the extent, again, he says it's reliable, but it is not infallible, right? We cannot control the actions of children. But what is also remarkable in this, when he makes this analogy between leadership in the home and all the rest, is that those who serve as elders or as overseers, they're not ignorant of ordinary life. 
again, contrast that with monks growing up in monasteries or whatever, that, that overseers are to have, be experienced in human interaction, in human in, uh, intercourse. And he also writes that they shouldn't be a uh, recent convert, or they may be, become prideful. And I read this, that the pride, you know, the, I think it was a good phrase, I, don't know, I think it was Matthew Henry that wrote, that pride is a sin that turned angels into devils. And so that even would apply within the church so they would not fall to the same condemnation. All right, and we close that list with, really with verse 7. Um, they, they, the overseers would have favorable testimony from two groups, insiders within the church, outsiders in the community. And it's interesting that Paul would include that because even in the midst of opposition or persecution or whatever, that they still should have within, among outsiders, among the community, uh, a general testimony, general reputation. All right, and then obviously the, the other section here, and we'll just go through this real quick, but qualifications for deacons um, is pretty much, in all the commentaries I read, they all referred to Acts 6 as being kind of the origin of the appointment of deacons, uh, the, the seven who were uh, appointed for that purpose, that they were to care, care for the needy, the widows, the needy, and free, allow the ministers the freedom to lead, to preach, to pray. Um, and then again, we have a lot of the same characteristics mentioned. Um, one, one thing I would like to go into before we close is, is verse 11, it, to me, is very interesting. If you look at it, and I have the ESV. I noticed when Colton read, you had the NASB? Yeah. So ESV, it says, their wives likewise must be dignified in these other characteristics. Literally, it says women. So the, the question becomes, well, is he referring to wives of deacons or is he referring to women deacons, deaconesses? Um, and really, you can make a biblical argument for either position. Um, the overall language, you know, on the one hand, the overall language of this chapter does seem to be kind of focused on men, you know, husband and one wife and all that. But that may just kind of be the generic sense. But there is scriptural support for the idea that you can have women deacon or deaconesses. Romans 16, 1, Paul closes out his letter to the church of Rome. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church. And that's certain. My Bible has a footnote for it. And it's the same word, diaconos, uh, which again could refer to um, having women deacons. It would be interesting, though, that if he includes that in the list of qualifications for deacons, the importance of the high standards for wives of deacons, but he didn't include it for elders, which is a higher position of authority, certainly within the church. So again, I would just say that uh, that is not the result of some idea of political correctness or women's labor, whatever. I was reading a commentary about Matthew Poole who is an English theologian from the 1600s. All right, he said it can be, st be understood either way. It could be women deacons. It could be the wives of deacons. Um, and that, you know, you couldn't really, uh, it's unwarranted to be dogmatic about either position. Uh, all right, and, and to close it up, I know our time is over. So we'll close up with verse 13. Uh, Paul writes that for those who serve well as deacons, gain a good standing for themselves and also a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So as he closes this list this way, maybe that the idea of, of being a deacon, being a servant may seem menial and unattractive to folks maybe, but Paul provides this commendation. It's like it pleases God to uh, commend those who serve well, uh, to crown their efforts and maybe provide an incentive to labor faithfully and diligently in that regard. And really, as we close on that verse, whether a person is a deacon or not, Jesus taught all of his followers to be servants, right? We could cite so many of his teachings in that regard. If anyone come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Or maybe the, the great example, when he washed his disciples' feet, after he did that, he says, a servant is not greater than his master, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also should wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. And if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So even though the focus on this chapter has been on elders and deacons uh, to meet these qualifications, you know, we all, to some degree, ought to exhibit these characteristics. We all should have the fruit of the Spirit. In you know, all these lists of qualifications, something each one of us should aspire to have. We are all called to humble service, and we all together, deacon, elder, otherwise, we all make up the household of God. So, you know, the, Paul's laying, stressing the importance of the, these positions of leadership, but the, the point of which is to lead the household of God, uh, the pillar and buttress of the truth. So, all right, with that, let, let's, I know our time's up, so let's close in prayer, okay? Lord, we do thank you uh, for this opportunity to gather together as your people and to focus upon this teaching in 1 Timothy as we consider uh, leadership within the church, but more importantly, I think, Lord, the role of the church as a whole to, to we make up your family, we make up the household of God, we carry your name, Lord Jesus, and we should live as we are, uh, as your children. Uh, we should live as a church with the purpose to support truth as revealed in your word. And I pray that we would take that responsibility uh, seriously as, as leaders within the church, but as your church as a whole, that we would uh, study your word, have a greater understanding of your word. We live out the truths of your word in our lives. And and by doing so, we just bring honor and glory to you. Thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for this day. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.